good evening to all our participants it gives me great pleasure to bring you this um, virtual symposium or webinar on sudep an update for physicians treating epilepsy from the ila task force so we have a very august uh, group of speakers here and i will first start by introducing my uh, co moderator dr kp vinayan uh, dr vinayan is the uh, professor and head of uh, pediatric neurology at amrita institute of uh, medical sciences at kochi he is a pediatric epileptologist and he's a member of many ila task forces the task force for uh, classification so he and i will be moderating this program and uh, my chair persons today are again very distinguished we have dr uh, reena surges who is an adult epileptologist at the university of bonn his special interests are um, sudden epilepsy sudden death in epilepsy and uh, devices to monitor seizures and uh, he is uh, he is chair of the ila sudep task force and uh, dr manjit tripathi i think does not need any introduction to this audience but uh, ma'am is the professor uh, of neurology at all india institute of medical sciences and the secretary of indian epilepsy society she is a very prominent adult epileptologist uh, with special interest in epilepsy surgery or human epilepsies and she is on the ila task force of stigma in epilepsy and epilepsy surgery so without any further delay we will start this symposium we are very uh, thrilled by the enthusiastic response to this uh, webinar and we will just start over to uh, dr sergeant and dr patil okay so i'm going to introduce our first speaker today and it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, dr torben thompson who is very famous for um, very important studies on different topics he's basically a um, professor of neurology emeritus professor at the karolinska karolinska institute in stockholm and his research focuses on life and on death namely on issues of pregnancies uh, malformations anti seizure medications but also on sudden unexpected death in epilepsy and this is what he is going to talk about today tobian we are looking very much forward to your talk thank you so much rania for this very kind introduction and thank you everyone for for joining us uh i would try to uh, share screen now and see if i succeed uh i think i do you can see it now so yes. oh, so my task is to sort of set the stage um to uh, give the definition talk about the incidence and risk factors of sudep these are my disclosures and i don't think they are relevant for for this talk but we um, should start with the definition and uh, and also a knowledge that sudep is a diagnosis of exclusion this is a definition proposed some 25 years ago by lena nashef sudep is an unexpected witnessed or unwitnessed non traumatic and non drowning death in a person with epilepsy with or without evidence for a seizure and excluding documented status epilepticus and in which post mortem examination does not reveal uh, any toxicologic or anatomic cause uh, for the death so anyone fulfilling all these criteria qualify for for uh, a definite sudep those that meet all criteria except having had a post mortem are labeled a probable sudep and there are also possible sudep cases and there are other more refined uh, definitions that have been suggested but i think the important thing to keep in mind is that when we discuss incidence and risk factors for instance usually those that have a definite sudep and a probable sudep are included in these uh, analysis so why should we bother about sudep uh, we should do so because it's a major cause of uh, the excess mortality in people with epilepsy any one of us can die suddenly and unexpectedly but if we have epilepsy the risk is 20 to 30 fold higher than if we don't have epilepsy so it's no surprise that among people up to 
49 years of age uh, in the population. SUDEP accounts for more than 20% of all sudden unexplained deaths in the general population of that age group, according to a population-based Danish uh, study. It's also been shown that the cumulative risk of SUDEP is in the order of 7 to 8% at a follow-up of 40 to 50 years uh, of childhood onset epilepsy. So SUDEP is really an important topic, both from an individual patient perspective and a public health perspective. What do we know about the circumstances uh, around SUDEP? Uh, these are data from, from our Swedish study. Uh, the the uh, bars in blue show circumstances for uh, SUDEP cases. Bars in red are non-SUDEP deaths in the same epilepsy study population. So you see that SUDEP patients are more likely to live alone. Uh, the deaths occur more, more commonly at home, in bed, at night, and most deaths are uh, unwitnessed, most SUDEP deaths. When they are witnessed, most of them take place in the aftermath of uh, a tonic-clonic seizure. And most SUDEP cases are found in a prone position. About the temporal distribution of SUDEP, to the left in this uh, graph, you see again our, our Swedish data in purple or red. Uh, you see that uh, the, the SUDEP cases are more likely to die during nighttime compared to the non SUDEP deaths. To the right, uh, you have a meta analysis of uh, close to 900 SUDEP cases um, showing that 60% of the SUDEP cases. Uh, occurred in conjunction with presumed sleep. So nighttime and sleep is is uh, a circumstance that is quite prominent among pseudo cases. What about the incidence rate of pseudo? I've summarized um, uh, data in this table, um, and you will see that when it comes to the incidence rate in childhood, data are to some extent conflicting. Uh, the rates have ranged from 0.2 per 1,000 patient years up to 1.1 per 1,000 patient years. The data are more consistent in adulthood uh, with a rate of 1.2 per 1,000 patient years in, in uh, most of the studies. However, it's very important to understand that within the epilepsy population, there's a wide uh, range in the incidence of SUDEP, uh, almost a 100 fold. And that depends on the presence or absence of various risk factors. The uh, American Academy of Neurology and American Epilepsy Society carried out uh, a systematic review and uh, published practice guidelines. Um, now a handful of years ago. The first task for this work was to look at the incidence of SUDEP. The second task was to look at specific risk factors for SUDEP. And a long list of potential risk factors were analyzed, but very few uh, came out uh, with uh, a moderate or a high confidence level. And you see them listed here. The most important by far was the occurrence of tonic-clonic seizures uh, with an odds ratio of uh, 10 compared to not having tonic-clonic seizures. The risk increased with the frequency of the tonic-clonic seizures. Uh, another risk factor was not, not adding an anti-seizure medication in patients with refractory epilepsy. And the lack of nocturnal supervision uh, was also associated with the increased risk. I will come back to that uh, in a bit. However, some additional studies have been published after the publication of these uh, AAN uh, recommendations. One study was carried out by us in Sweden. It was a nation-based, population-based study, and I will show you some data uh, from that study. It included 
more than 250 pseudo cases and five times as many living epilepsy controls from the same study population. We had information from medical records, from autopsy reports, and also from our national uh, patient register. We looked at uh, the uh, risk in conjunction uh, with, uh, with uh, seizures. Um, and when we talk about tonic-clonic seizures here, um, we mean generalized tonic-clonic seizures as well as focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures. No distinction is made between the two. However, if patients had seizures, but not tonic-clonic seizures, there was actually no significant increase in the risk. The risk was related to the occurrence of tonic-clonic seizures. As you can see, a 20-fold increased risk if a patient had had a tonic-clonic seizure uh, during the preceding year. History of nocturnal tonic-clonic seizures was also identified as an important risk factor with an odds ratio in the order of eight to nine. And nocturnal seizures have been uh, identified as a risk factor also in, in previous studies. This is a, a rather old but big case control study from the UK. Um, seizure patterns uh, were based on interviews of the treating physician, and they were classified into those with diurnal seizures, uh, meaning those who only had seizures during daytime, and nocturnal seizure patterns which were patients that had seizures also during nighttime. And you see that the nocturnal pattern was more prevalent among the pseudo cases to the left compared to among the controls. And it was identified as a risk factor with an odds ratio of 2.6. Uh, a difference here compared to, to, to the previous study was that here um, there was no distinction made between different types of seizures. A uh, quite recent uh, publication um, from France uh, looked at uh, suited cases uh, among cohorts of pharmacoresistant focal epilepsies. And again, nocturnal seizures came out as uh, a highly significant risk factor. And interesting also, being able to alert someone of an oncoming seizure was associated with a reduced risk of uh, uh, SUDEP. I go back again to the this uh, rather old case control study from the UK, uh, where having someone sharing bedroom uh, or having some special precautions like listening devices in the bedroom was associated with uh, a marked reduction in SUDEP risk. If we go to our Swedish case control data, we uh, uh, found that uh, living conditions uh, affected the level of uh, SUDEP risk. So sharing household, but not a bedroom, was associated with about a twofold increased risk compared to uh, sharing a bedroom. And living alone, was associated with a four to six fold increased risk for SUDEP compared to sharing a bedroom with someone. So having nocturnal seizures uh, and being unattended um, seems to be a very important uh, uh, combination that increases the risk. And the interaction between all control of tonic-clonic seizures and living conditions is illustrated in this table, where those that had tonic-clonic seizures, be it one or more during the preceding year, and living alone, had a 60 to 80-fold increased risk of SUDEP compared to those that were free from tonic-clonic seizures and shared a bedroom. So a dramatic increased risk in, in uh, SUDEP for these patients. What about uh, treatment with anti-seizure medications? 
Uh, in our analysis, we did not find uh, an association between use of any specific anti-seizure medication and an increased risk of SUDEP, which has been discussed in the past. We did not find support for that. You may also recall that in the past, polytherapy with anti-seizure medications have been suggested as a risk factor for SUDEP. However, and this is the point I want to make with this slide. You need to understand that polytherapy could be a reflection of uh, a more difficult to treat epilepsy. So if, if you adjust for the frequency of tonic-clonic seizures, you actually see that polytherapy is associated with the reduction in the risk of SUDEP, not uh, a trend for an increase in the risk of SUDEP. And this is very much in line with this important meta-analysis that was carried out some years ago by Philippe Ruvelin and his group. Um, they uh, uh, analyzed more than 100 typical add-on trials um, where patients that continue have to have seizures despite an ongoing treatment with anti-seizure medications are randomized to add on with either placebo or an active medication. And those that were randomized to add on to their regular baseline anti-seizure medication with placebo had a sevenfold higher risk of SUDEP compared to those that were randomized to add on with an efficacious uh, medication. So, Adding in inpatients that continue to have seizures, uh, polytherapy might be uh, beneficial. Um, and these data clearly support that. What about uh, taking the medication as prescribed? What about adherence and non-adherence? These are back to the Swedish population-based data. We looked at the regularity of dispensing of anti-seizure medications, um, you would expect that someone that uh, takes his medication as prescribed would um, go back to the pharmacy uh, to uh, have a new dispension of his medication after uh, 90 days, uh, because you, you get medication supply for, for 90 days uh, with your prescription. However, those that did not have uh, a dispension within the time frame of 181 days or even even a longer interval had a two to threefold increased risk in uh, in SUDEP. So that is something that clearly indicates uh, a non-adherence with the medication. We also looked at information in the medical records about uh, non-adherence. And again, we found that those that were considered in the medical records to be non-adherent with the medication they had been prescribed had a two to threefold increased risk of um, SUDEP. This is very much in line with the more recent and, and uh, much smaller study from, from uh, Australia uh, where declining adherence was associated with an increased risk for SUDEP. Uh, and also uh, addition of a second to fourth anti-seizure medication offered increased protection. So very much in line with the previous data that I shared with, shared with you. What about comorbidities? The Swedish data indicated that substance abuse and alcohol dependence was associated uh, with increased risk, also after adjustment for uh, a number of potential confounders. Intellectual disability in the crude analysis appeared to be associated with an increased risk of, of SUDEP, and that has also been proposed in, in some previous studies. However, again, it might well be that patients with intellectual disability also have a more severe epilepsy and more frequent tonic-clonic seizures. So again, if you adjust for that, in fact, those with intellectual disability do not seem to have 
uh, an increased risk for SUDEP. So I'm coming to my conclusions. As I mentioned, and as you're all well aware, SUDEP is a diagnosis of exclusion. It's also a major cause of death among people with epilepsy. And the incidence is in the order of one per 1,000 patient years, possibly uh, lower in children. It usually occurs at home during nighttime, in most cases unwitnessed, but when it is witnessed, in, in the vast majority of cases, uh, it occurs in the postictal phase of a major convulsive seizure. Also, obviously, uh, the risk level varies between patients depending on uh, risk factors. And the by far most important risk factor is the occurrence of tonic-clonic seizures, followed by nocturnal seizures, medication, uh, non-adherence, and lack of nighttime supervision. I think you would agree that um, many of these risk factors are modifiable, but if we want to be successful in the modification uh, of the risk factors and thus a reduction in the risk of SUDEP, we have to, should involve patients and caregivers. And I think we will hear more about that uh, later on in this webinar. With that, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, I would request participants to post their questions in the Q&A. Uh, thank you for that excellent talk, uh, Dr. Ogon. There's one question. Uh, it's probably related to pathophysiology. They're asking, is there any role of uh, neurotropic factors like uh, VDNF in SUDEP? Not, not that I'm aware of, but I think there are other members of the panel that are, um, are better suited to answer that. So I, I, I'll ask you a question. Uh, how can you study the epidemiology of SUDEP in low resource settings when there is no question of an autopsy, yeah, any deaths yeah, occur yeah, unwitnessed yeah. at home? So yeah. how effective is a verbal autopsy in these situations? Yeah. So it, it, it is really uh, an important question. and. Uh, it is a, a true challenge. Um, and the verbal autopsy is, is what we have. And um, I, I, I think the validity uh, varies markedly. Uh, and, and that is difficult to draw firm conclusions from, from, from pseudo studies based purely on verbal autopsies. And there are also major difficulties in, in uh, using the national healthcare registers that we have in, in some of the European countries, because uh, up to now, SUDEP is not uh, uh, we, uh, recorded with an ICD code in, in the registers that we have. So it, it's really very hard work to do epidemiological studies of high validity with SUDEP, even in, in, the, uh, in the countries that are um, better off when it comes to resources. I think it is challenging. Um, so one question is that, is there any increased risk of children who have comorbid cerebral palsy and intellectual disability? Are they at, at high risk for SUDEP? This is someone looking specifically at these risk factors. Mm -hmm. Again, I think Elizabeth is probably better better suited to answer that because it's a specific pediatric uh, uh, question. Uh, I, I I I think when when you as as I try to show with the example of intellectual disability, you you really need to adjust for the frequency of tonic clonic seizures because some of the comorbidities you mentioned are also associated with with uh, worse seizure control. Elizabeth, is there something you want to answer now, or? Um, I think, uh, thank you, Torbjorn. I, I mean, I think you you highlighted the fact that really it's where all these comorbidities intersect. I think the important thing uh, to know for sure about children with, um, you know, significant neurodisability, if it's uh, cerebral palsy or or other conditions, is that they have an increased risk of mortality overall owing to their neurodisability, most of that mortality that we see is related to 
um, respiratory uh, dysfunction, pneumonias, aspirations, things like that. Um, so they do have an increased risk of SUDEP, but when you compare, when you control for seizure severity, I don't think we really have that teased out. Do you, do you think that's a uh, fair to say, Tormier? Yes, I would agree yeah. completely. Thank you. And also an another thing, the uh, SUDEP as as the relative contribution to overall uh, excess mortality in, in, in these patient groups is, is less than in, in, in others because of the other, the other causes of death that right. you mentioned. And also when you look at mortality in children with epilepsy, mortality is generally low in children in general. So of course the uh, relative rates of mortality in children with significant neurological disorders puts the standardized mortality ratio quite high. Hmm. There are many more questions, but we can take them in the end. Otherwise, we'll be just discussing only this one talk. <laughs> so I think we can move on with the next talk. We have questions. Yeah. If we, we have time at the end for uh, general discussion as well. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Yeah. Very interesting questions. I think they also better suit to the uh, upcoming talks as well, and then we have a better uh, ground to discuss them. So thanks very much for this great talk, Torben. Now uh, it's again a pleasure to introduce an advanced early career a research fellow uh, from the Department of Neurology at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. And it is Dr. Shobi Sibatambu, uh, who has uh, greatly worked already on uh, different aspects of pathophysiology and biomarkers that may predict an uh, elevated uh, risk of dying suddenly. And also focusing on autonomic dysfunction and cardiac dysfunction in people with epilepsy. So we are, we are looking forward to your talk, Shobi. Thank you kindly, Dr. Serges, and for being a mentor and inspiration in this field. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about the pathophysiology focusing on heart versus brain mechanisms. Um, so I think um, we tend to view epilepsy as more of a brain disorder, but in reality, it has a number of systemic effects um, on different organs, especially the heart. The brain and heart have an important relationship, which is particularly relevant um, to SUDEP, which I'll go into. So um, the objectives of this um, talk, I'll go through the benign cardiac and respiratory changes that you're probably familiar with in your patients, and then go into um, brain and respiratory mechanisms relating to SUDEP, and then cardiac mechanisms. So there are a number of um, ictal and postictal cardiac changes that occur during seizures. So tachycardia, um, ictal sinus tachycardia is one of the most common uh, changes seen in up to 90% of seizures, which can often persist postictally, particularly in um, tonic clonic seizures where it can last um, four hours. Ictal bradycardia is far less common in less than 10% um, of patients with epilepsy. Um, ictal asystole can occur in um, a, sm a small um, proportion of seizures as well, about 0.4% of all uh, patients undergoing video EEG admission. Um, um, and uh, post-ictal ventricular tachycardias and fibrillation as well as atrial fibrillation are far less common, um, but if they occur, it's typically after a, a tonic-clonic seizure and may be an added risk factor for SUDEP. Um, ictal and postictal um, respiratory changes are also quite common. Um, ictal apnea and hypopnea um, is probably one of the more common changes that we see in about half of all seizures with more when they're more likely to be central, um, but some can also be obstructive and mixed, particularly in tonic-clonic seizures where you can have upper airway um, obstruction associated with the seizure. About a third of all seizures are also associated with ictal hypoxemia, um, and it's more uh, pronounced in tonic-clonic seizures. Tachypnea and hypercapnia are also quite common, um, particularly in tonic-clonic seizures, um, and this is likely because of the profound uh, convulsive activity as well as the um, pause in breathing, which can result in uh, metabolic acidosis and CO2 retention, which leads to uh, over-breathing to get rid of that. 
Postictal central apnea, on the other hand, is quite uncommon um, and it has been suggested to be implicated in uh, SUDEP. So going to the, one of the most um, you know, important studies that have uh, shaped our understanding of uh, mechanisms is the Mortimer study led by Philippe Rivlin. Um, it looks at the, um, it pulled um, a whole number of uh, arrests in epilepsy monitoring units uh, worldwide and pulled together all of these cases. Um, so there were 11 uh, monitored SUDEP cases um, with respiratory activity, um, uh, sorry, 10 had respiratory activity derived from analysis of the video because there were no direct um, respiratory uh, measurements. And this identified a number of patterns. Um, most uh, cases uh, occurred directly out of sleep um, and where able to be assessed, um, all patients were found in the prone position. Interestingly, also, there was um, at least one tonic-clonic seizure in the preceding uh, 12 hours prior to the seizure. So when we look at the actual mechanisms um, that this study um, looked at, um, there was always one focal onset tonic-clonic seizure in the preceding 12 hours. And when we go back to um, some of the changes that we see that are more pronounced in tonic-clonic seizures, such as postictal um, tachycardia, as well as um, hyperventilation, there might be a sort of a cumulative effect of multiple seizures that may make this more likely. Which then leads to the focal onset um, tonic-clonic seizure, which is the terminal seizure. Um, which is followed by a period of hyperventilation, so rapid breathing, which um, is quite common, followed by postictal generalized EEG suppression, which can occur um, after uh, tonic-clonic seizures, um, as well as transient bradycardia or asystole and central apnea. And then always there was terminal apnea, so terminal respiratory arrest driving the terminal asystole, which um, led to death in all of these cases. So a very consistent pattern. Um, and these are some of the tracings from the cases where, as you can see, death occurred within a couple of minutes to the longest being about 18 minutes. There are a number of limitations, of course, with this study. Um, uh, it's, it was a very small sample size and it's a very enriched um, population of focal uh, surgical cases undergoing video EG monitoring. So it may not be representative of a broad epilepsy population. For example, generalized epilepsies have equal rates of SUDEF, but the mechanisms in that population may vary. They were also no direct respiratory or pulse oximetry measurements, which really interpretate um, our findings of this. And it um, makes you unable to look at, for example, obstructive apneas. Um, going to and pooling all of this together, SUDEP is likely not one mechanism, but likely an interaction of a number of mechanisms that cause death in patients. So there's often um, a susceptible host and they may not be taking their medications, they might be sleep deprived and they're more prone to having a seizure. Um, and then postictally, they could be in a vulnerable state. So it could be a seizure out of sleep. Um, they could be in the prone position and their environment is lacking, um, you know, absence of supervision or someone to reposition and stimulate them, um, which can then break down into impaired cardiac, um, cardiac respiratory function, as well as arousal um, and dysregulation of neurotransmitters, which can um, lead to death in these patients. And there's also um, some hypotheses around uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, dysfunction. So central control of breathing is important for SUDEP when we look at brain mechanisms. Um, the um, pre-Boltzinger complex in the ventral respiratory group of the medulla is the respiratory pacemaker of the brain, which initiates respiratory rhythm, which then projects to the dorsal respiratory group um, for diaphragm stimulation and breathing. In seizures, um, these structures um, can receive input from areas where uh, seizure activity has um, come from. So particularly uh, limbic and paralimbic regions can project to these areas which can modulate breathing. Um, and we know this from direct uh, electrical stimulation studies where um, structures such as the amygdala, hippocampus, anterior, parahippal, um, campal gyrus um, can all lead to inhibition of breathing.
Uh, a number of imaging studies have now shown that um, areas that can control breathing and autonomic function um, show volume loss in those areas, um, such as the midbrain, paradactyl, um, gray, um, raphe nuclear regions in the medulla of SUDEP cases. Um, why that is, it's unclear. Um, this was a really elegant study by Allen and colleagues, which looked at uh, patients who had tonic-clonic uh, seizures with um, mild to moderate hypoxia as well as severe hypoxia on the top. And both, um, both of those groups showed uh, volume loss in the medulla of the lower brain brainstorm, um, which control all of these sort of vital functions, as well as the parabrachial area of the pons. But it was certainly more pronounced in the um, group with severe hypoxia. Um, so potentially repeated uh, seizures over time can um, result in impaired uh, respiratory functioning um, cent of central control. So post ictal EEG suppression is something that has been observed in every uh, case in the Mortimer study preceding the terminal cardiac and respiratory changes. It's quite an abnormal pattern of diffuse EEG activity, um, and it's defined by um, EEG activity no more than um, 10 um, milliamplitudes, uh, millivolts in amplitude, allowing for various artifacts. It is quite an inconsistent feature. So in the same patient, you might see one seizure with PGS and one without. Um, and this is an example of PGS where there's clearly diffuse flattening and it most commonly occurs after a tonic-clonic seizure. So PGS um, is increased in seizures occurring out of sleep, um, as well as uh, delayed um, oxygen administration. There are certainly some um, brainstem posturing um, semiologies that are associated with increased PGS duration um, and hypoxemia. Um, the underlying mechanisms of PGS are poorly understood and probably multifactorial, um, but it can come from dysfunction of the subcortical and brainstem networks, um, as well as uh, neurotransmitters that are released, such as adenosine, which is an anticonvulsant, um, and um, seizures um, can be associated with cortical uh, spreading depression as well as major hypoxia and acute um, hypercapnia. So um, this is some work from um, our um, institution, which looked at tonic-clonic seizures with and without PGS. So on the top um, panel, you have the median uh, minimum and maximum heart rate. And um, on the bottom panel, you have the median uh, minimum and maximum heart uh, respiratory rate. So as you can see that um, in the red, uh, marked by the red, those cases were had PGS. Even at baseline, they had uh, lower cardiac and respiratory rates, um, which um, was maintained during the seizure and postictally. So there might be some predisposition um, to where um, reduced respiratory rate or cardiac um, rate and hypoxemia might uh, increase the risk of developing PGS. And this is emphasized by um, the impact of um, interventions, periectal interventions. Um, we know that early nursing interventions and particularly administration of oxygen as well as suction and turning the patient onto their side um, reduces hypoxemia duration, PGS duration, as well as seizure and convulsive um, duration. So these are some couple of cases of PGS and cardiorespiratory dysfunction in relation to SUDEP. Um, this is nice um, work by Vayela and colleagues, which looked at um, some SUDEP cases where there was PGS associated with a postictal um, central apnea, as you can see annotated there, um, with an oxygen um, saturation near dear of 63%. Um, and later this patient died of what was thought to be SUDEP, and this is uh, one of our cases from the Royal Melbourne Hospital, which uh, looked at a case of um, a patient who had postictal atrial fibrillation um, in the context of two back-to-back tonic-clonic seizures within minutes apart. Um, the postictal AF um, started after the about 90 seconds after 
um, the seizure termination of the first seizure, um, where there was PGS and um, postictal atrial fibrillation, which um, persisted for about 12 hours before um, finally reverting to sinus rhythm. Unfortunately, this patient subsequently um, passed away of SUDEP. Um, it's unlikely that atrial fibrillation itself is a leading, is a mechanism um, that can cause death, but it is probably um, a marker of autonomic instability in such patients. So whether um, PGS is a marker of increased SUDEP risk is something that remains to be um, it remains to be investigated and there are certainly efforts um, along the way. There have been a couple of small studies, um, one by Samden Latu's group, which, uh, which found um, a positive association between uh, PGS duration and increased pseudop risk, particularly evident at 50 seconds or more. Um, but Dr. Serges's group um, did not find that association. So um, it's really as much as PGS does occur in every case, um, there are lots of PGS um, like following a tonic-clonic seizure that doesn't then turn into SUDEP. So likely it's a lot more multifactorial, um, but yeah, efforts are definitely underway to determine whether this is a biomarker of SUDEP risk. And then going to um, something that's sort of emerged in the last few years in particular, which is really um, looking at SUDEP and it's really a very broad definition that probably encompasses a number of um, um, sudden deaths, including sudden cardiac death in epilepsy. And I think the current definitions are overlapping and fraught with limit uh, limitations. Um, and we really need to understand uh, the risk factors. And this is some nice work from Veria and colleagues who have sort of um, tried to come up with some preliminary um, risk factors that may help identify uh, SUDEP versus sudden cardiac death in patients with epilepsy. So SUDEP is, they've hypothesized that it's more likely to be a periectal event triggered by a convulsive seizures. Um, patients are typically found in dead in bed in the prone position and the risk factors tend to be poor control associated with um, epilepsy. Whereas sudden cardiac death in epilepsy, patients tend to die um, commonly not in association with a seizure, but during daily activities. And the risk factors are often cardiovascular risk factors. And this can be a result of repeated seizures over time, um, as well as epilepsy treatments, such as um, potent enzyme inducers, which um, can increase the risk of developing um, cardiovascular disease. The, um, there are also um, potential inherited cases of both epilepsy and, um, and cardiac arrhythmias. This is one of our cases um, who underwent uh, cardio um, loop, uh, loop monitoring long-term. Um, and this patient had an epileptic encephalopathy um, and had multiple episodes of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So um, they were almost always associated with a tonic-clonic seizure, not always febrile. Um, uh, preceding about one hour preceding um, the seizure. Um, this patient also turned out to have an SCN1B deletion, but the significance is still unknown. But um, SCN1B can be associated with um, epilepsy as well as cardiac abnormalities. So there's potentially um, a possibility of inheriting both an increased risk of epilepsy as well as cardiac arrhythmias, which um, can interplay and increase the risk of um, mortality in this population. Um, patients with uh, who have died of SUDEP also have different um, blunted responses, for example, for heart rate. So they might have some autonomic dysfunction. So this is um, a study done um, when they looked at heart rate changes in patients who died of SUDEP versus controls um, between uh, at the end of hyperventilation and four minutes following, um, which found that they had a blunted um, response in SUDEP cases compared to um, the controls who were able to uh, respond more adequately. So again, this may underlie um, more complex autonomic dysfunction in this population. Heart rate variability is a pretty um, common, um, widely used measure of studying autonomic um, cardiac control. Uh, it's derived from studying um, the variations in adjacent heartbeat intervals and calculated using many 
um, time domain and spectral components. Um, decreased heart rate variability is often predictive of a number of cardiovascular um, disease states, um, particularly sudden death in cardiovascular populations. So it's been explored um, quite a bit in uh, SUDEP. Um, and this is a case report um, showing that there is um, increased uh, heart rate variability dysfunction in lead up um, to death. And there seems to be a temporal component to this. Um, and high frequency power in the red is a marker of um, vagal tone, so vagal cardiac tone, um, which seems to be hyperactive prior to death. Um, but again, this is one case. So we looked at this in um, 31 CDEP cases and uh, match controls from uh, nine tertiary centers to find that um, low frequency power during wakefulness was um, decreased in the SUDEP group. Um, each 1% um, incremental reduction also to normalized low frequency power um, actually sped up the latency to SUDEP. So um, uh, the lower the um, low frequency power, the faster time um, from the end of video AG monitoring to SUDEP. There's also interestingly a positive correlation in sleep between the time to SUDEP and normalized high frequency power, which is um, a marker of vagal tone. Um, and this may have a cardioprotective element to it. Um, and this is something that we see in um, myocardial infarction, post-myocardial infarction as a marker of recovery. And we also found that when we combined um, these factors, um, the predictive model um, predicted the latency to SUDEP um, with a C statistic of 0 0.70. Um, so in summary, um, the mechanisms that really lead to SUDEP are quite heterogeneous. I think the most, um, the evidence that we have so far certainly points to a more brain uh, mediated uh, collapse of cardiorespiratory um, function following a tonic bonic seizure, um, which is in contrast to the sort of self-limiting um, ictal cardiorespiratory features that we see um, ordinarily. Um, primary cardiac causes may definitely also contribute, but um, these sort of circumstances and risk factors are poorly understood, and we really need better epidemiological data, risk factors, and biomarkers to sort of tease out these cases because um, they'll definitely have different um, preventative strategies uh, for the development of more targeted approaches to prevent um, mortality in this population. So um, that is my talk and thank you so much for attending and listening and for inviting me to be part of this. Yeah, thank you, Shobi. Uh, that was a very wonderful talk on uh, different aspects of the pathophysiological mechanisms in SUDEP. So especially that uh, PGS thing, uh, is there any difference between the type of seizure, like that means focal to bilateral and tonic tonic seizures or a primary generalized epilepsy or the type of from where the focality arises like an insular seizure versus uh, seizures from not so autonomically active area is there a study like that um so typically um the more insular insular um is obviously a very powerful uh, control of cardiovascular control. So typically the seizures that are associated with um, from the insula can be more profound, so more profound tachycardia. Um, temporal lobe seizures are more likely to be associated with ictal asystole. So there is definitely some regional um, differences. In terms of tonic-clonic seizure, um, seizures, I think the whole um, seizures themselves are quite profound. So. I am not aware of anything that directly compares the region um, of onset because to, um, those sort of tonic-clonic seizures tend to be tend to have really profound effects, um, irrespective. Um, but uh, certainly in the focal onset seizures that don't progress, you can definitely see differences um, depending on where the onset is. Yeah. So that uh, so you're you're told that uh, the duration of PGS is supposedly in some groups showed some effect on the, the, the cardiac effect and then the, uh, the, 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 the chance of SUDEP, but some of the studies didn't show that. So is there any hypothesis uh, 
from here and why some studies are showing it, some studies are not showing it. Yeah, I think these have largely been very small studies um, of, you know, 17, 10 cases. And PGS alone is, um, I wouldn't say that's a marker alone of pseudep risk. I would say that um, it might be that more long um, pseudep, um, PGS, sorry, PGS is associated with more likely, uh, more profound cardiorespiratory dysfunction. But I think it's mostly because the studies have been quite um, heterogeneous, uh, um, um, sorry, limited to certain populations um, and quite small. So I think as we start to tease this out, because um, we're doing a worldwide um, study on SUDEP uh, biomarkers and PGS, um, I think that will sort of tease it out. Um, but there are certainly many cases of tonic-clonic seizures where we see PGS and no cardiorespiratory dysfunction. Um, so just um, I think that alone itself, I'm not sure that that in itself is a risk factor, but I think we have to look at other factors and how this affects other functions. Yeah, see, that is basically that uh, most of the cases of CDEP is unmonitored, so we don't know the, yes. the exact things uh, at that point. So uh, there is some questions here. Uh, I don't know whether we have time. So as soon as we'll go to the next talk uh, or we'll take one more. So Maybe there is one, a, one question. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so there, there, there is a question here. Uh, uh, what is the role of pacemaker implantation, especially in patients with ictal asystole? So whether it will lessen the risk of SUDEP? So um, for it treatment for ictal asystole, um, the pay, uh, if you can't get control of the seizures themselves, um, pacemaker is an excellent um, uh, uh, preventative measure of preventing falls and syncope. Um, for SUDEP, it's not really validated or unclear, and there have certainly been published cases where um, patients with uh, a pacemaker have subsequently died of SUDEP, so likely more complex mechanisms. So for SUDEP prevention, um, no, but for the ictal um, asystole and prevention of syncope, yes. Yeah, so the next question is, uh, you, will you recommend autonomic function testing in uncontrolled nocturnal GTCS at this point? With our data. Um, yeah, I think we're slowly getting there. And I think, um, so there's currently nothing validated at the moment, but certainly with, you know, uh, smartwatches and smart technology, we'll be able to collect a lot more informative data long-term to study those patterns um, in relation to seizures and seizure patterns and how that might change over time. But currently there's no evidence per se. The best evidence is still um, prevention of nocturnal or seizure control of tonic-clonic seizures. Okay, so that's the message. So over to the next talk. Yeah, welcome uh, back again. So we've uh, gone about 50 minutes uh, with uh, looking at the definition, the pathophysiology, the risk factors uh, of uh, SUDEP. And of course, uh, we've looked at, uh, you know, uh, two wonderful speakers. Uh, it's a pleasure to invite the third, uh, you know, wonderful speaker, which is Dr. Elizabeth Donner. She's the director of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Program at the Hospital for Sick Children and Michael Behan, uh, Chair in Epilepsy Research uh, at the University of uh, Toronto. Her clinical work is focused on medical, dietary and surgical treatments of drug-resistant epilepsy in children. Dr. Donner leads a research program which is focused on identifying those at most at risk for SUDEP. Uh, in addition, she has a strong commitment to epilepsy advocacy in professional as well as in lay communities. She's a chair of Partners Against Mortality in Epilepsy um, in a co-lead lead of ECO Ontario. And she is going to talk to us about can we prevent SUDEP? Elizabeth? Good morning from Toronto, or evening, depending where you are, or very late evening for others. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. I think let me just get my screens organized so that I can see what's happening here. Great. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and join uh, these excellent speakers. Um, and 
try and answer what is a pretty challenging question. Can we prevent SUDEP? So this is me for the last 20 to 25 years asking people to talk about SUDEP. And uh, for the first, I'd say 15 of those years, I got this answer. Why bother talking about SUDEP? There is no way to prevent it. I'm really excited now that we are actively talking about how to prevent SUDEP um, because uh, I was sick of hearing this. I think there are lots of reasons to talk about SUDEP and I know Dr. Blank is gonna be addressing this later. There are lots of reasons to talk about SUDEP even though uh, people felt we couldn't prevent it. So I don't think we need a prevention as a, as a reason to talk about it, but I was kind of getting sick of people asking me this. And now uh, a simple Google Scholar search yields lots of strong literature investigating whether we can prevent SUDEP, how we can present, prevent SUDEP, and different approaches. So for me, it's a really exciting time to think about SUDEP prevention. As I mentioned, there's a few different ways of thinking about this. And um, I thought that this here presented on this slide is a little bit of an approach to SUDEP prevention. And, and what are some of the different ways we can target um, or ask this question. I think based on what we heard from uh, Dr. Thompson about uh, risk factors, we could certainly consider optimizing epilepsy care as a suit up prevention technique. Based on what we understand about suit up mechanisms and underlying pathophysiology um, from our last speaker, I think we can consider how we may improve the peri and post ictal environment to improve safety and prevent suit up that way. And then finally, there's always the question of whether we have any suit up prevention devices available to us now or in the future. So let's dive into these a little bit more. First, let's talk about ep optimizing epilepsy care. So most of us would say that if there was one take home message from any talk about suit up, it's that you come away knowing that the presence and frequency of generalized tonic-clonic seizures is the most important risk factor for SUDEP. So certainly we could extrapolate from that that if we can reduce the frequency of generalized tonic-clonic seizures, we will be reducing seizure, we will be reducing SUDEP risk. So what strategies do we have to reduce seizure frequency? Obviously, optimizing medical therapy is one selecting the appropriate anti-seizure medications and specifically targeting generalized tonic-clonic seizures and focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures. Um, these things seem obvious. However, we know that this doesn't always happen with regards to um, medical, with regards to uh, medical treatment. This can mean referral to the appropriate there, uh, center um, and really thoughtful approaches to uh, seizure drug selection. It's interesting in my reading that when we think about the clinical trials that bring our new medications to the market, they're often in um, individuals having focal seizures and uh, they don't specifically call out or target necessarily um, the effect of the new treatment on generalized tonic-clonic or focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures. And there has been a suggestion by some that in fact, we, in, we should be including these outcomes specifically in um, the investigational trials for new drugs so that we're able to um, extrapolate how these drugs may modify risk for those seizures, obviously, and risk for SUDEP. This study was already reviewed, so I won't go into too much detail, but the question is, does optimizing medical treatment reduce the risk of SUDEP? And Dr. Rivlin and his colleagues demonstrated that optimizing medication, tr medical treatment does reduce the risk of SUDEP when they reviewed um, randomized controlled trials of add-on medications and found that the rates of SUDEP in people who received an efficacious 
anti-seizure medication dose was about seven times lower than in people who were allocated to placebo, suggesting that optimizing treatment, adding new drugs does reduce CVIP risk. How else can we optimize care to reduce risk? Well, timely referral for non-medical therapies. So what is the evidence that non-medical therapies such as um, resective epilepsy surgery, VNS, RNS, uh, these are uh, vagal nerve stimulator, responsive nerve stimulation. What is the evidence that these treatments reduce risk of SUDEP? Well, there's been two large studies and a number of other um, investigations looking at the SUDEP rates in people who have undergone resective epilepsy surgery. Uh, the two I reference here and referenced uh, here um, with uh, Mike Sperling's work and also uh, Dr. Cassidy's work demonstrate that um, the SUDEP rates are lower in people who have undergone epilepsy surgery. So um, in Dr. Sperling's study, SUDEP rates were 10 per 1,000 person years in people who didn't undergo surgery versus five in per 1,000 person years in people who did. And um, in the other study, um, we see also a similar reduction. So I think that there was some controversy about the role of surgery in SUDEP reduction, I think in the earlier literature, but at this time, I think we can say with confidence that resective epilepsy surgery does reduce epilepsy risk. And uh, there was some suggestion that that reduced SUDEP risk. There was some suggestion that the reduction in SUDEP uh, risk lasts for about 10 years. And then after that, you might start to lose that benefit when you look into the, into the numbers. And I think that needs further uh, investigation. The other thing to point out is that this data really does make sense because when it's not just having surgery, but it's having the reduced number of generalized tonic clonic seizures that is associated with the lower suit up risk in the studies that actually looked at that. There's also data looking at VNS and RNS suggesting, and these are smaller studies, but suggesting that SUDEP rates are lower in patients treated with these interventions. So timely referral for non-medical therapies is another way that we can optimize epilepsy care with an eye on SUDEP prevention. Finally, in this category, how about education and knowledge sharing? Does telling people about SUDEP and counseling them reduce SUDEP risk? Let's first talk about this idea of risk stratification. There's not a whole lot of evidence here about, there's not a whole lot of evidence here about the role of these tools in SUDEP risk reduction, but there has been some nice efforts put in, first by Dr. DiGiorgio and his group developing something called the SUDEP 7 in, um, inventory, which is on the right side of my screen. And then more recently, um, Dr. Revlin and uh, Dr. Picot worked with Dr. Saran here to develop what they're calling the SUDEP care score. The goal of both of these tools is to help the clinician to stratify risk for the person sitting in their office to think about how high is your risk of SUDEP and how can that guide discussion. And we're going to hear later from Dr. Blank about how and when and if we should be talking about SUDEP. But this whole idea of using a tool to help us guide that conversation and perhaps empower that patient or family sitting in front of us is important. You can see that both these tools focus on the most um, important SUDEP risk factor, which is generalized tonic-clonic frequency. Um, and they also both include intellectual disability um, as um, another risk factor. The SUDEP care score, which was developed uh, more recently, includes some more important risk factors that have come out more recently. And so this was just not that long ago published. So we'll see how it uh, works in practice going forward. What about just talking about SUDEP? Does talking about SUDEP reduce the risk? Well, how could it do that? It could influence adherence to treatments. And we heard about core adherence as a risk factor from, for SUDEP. We heard about that from Dr. Thompson. Uh, it could also, sorry about that. It could also modify people's lifestyle choices if they're aware about SUDEP. We heard about the home environment and how that 
can influence SUDEP risk as far as if they live alone, if they share a room, and it may influence people's adoption of new treatments, uh, surgical treatments, um, that, that kind of approach. So the for many years I've been hearing about this uh, and hearing back from people that there's a significant concern that talking about SUDEP may cause more harm than good. I've clipped here just a few studies. There's been a fair bit of work now looking at people's preferences with regards to SUDEP discussion, but I've clipped these three studies because um, they, uh, first of all, are uh, from diverse areas of uh, the world rather than always focusing on North American studies. We have data from Germany, data here um, from Dr. Tripathi's group, who uh, is one of our, our panel members here today, and uh, data um, from Malaysia demonstrating that telling people about SUDEP did not cause significant harm. And in two of these studies did change people's practice with regards to their epilepsy. So I hope this is evidence that talking about SUDEP can reduce risk. So we talked about modifying epilepsy treatment as a way of, or optimizing epilepsy treatment as a way of preventing SUDEP. How about improving the post-ictal safety environment? So we've heard that SUDEP is most often from sleep. We've heard that decedents are found most often in the prone position. And then things like home environment actually modify risk. So how could we improve the post-ictal uh, safety environment? First of all, we can modify the home environment as a prevention strategy. I think Dr. Thompson's data is so compelling with regards to this and modify the sleep environment, likewise with that data from Dr. Thompson. And then there's some really interesting um, approaches that I would say are still under investigation and not really ready for prime time, but um, are, are very important. So based on the hypothetical mechanism that implicates um, adenosine and brainstem depression, this idea that with a seizure, uh, we get um, an influx of adenosine and that the inhibitory actions of adenosine are important for stopping the seizure. But at the same time, those inhibitory mechanisms may result in brainstem depression that through a cascade precipitates SUDEP. And based on the observations for years that uh, serotonin enhances respiration in the postictal period, people have studied this, are studying this in uh, depth in animal models. I would direct you to a really excellent review by Dr. Um, and it's more than a review, it's a, it's a review, but also a proposal of mechanisms by Dr. Fangold and Dr. Fung pu published in 2023, just this year for more information about this, this topic. But this idea, so in animal models, people have looked at serotonergic drugs and um, uh, demonstrated that in certain animal models, uh, using serotonergic drugs does prevent SUDEP in animals that are known to have a SUDEP in the post period. It's also enticing to consider the role of adenosine blockers. However, what we know is that we need our adenosine to help to terminate the seizure. So if we block adenosine, that may risk impairing seizure termination. So that's still to be worked out. But I wanted to share some of these kind of exciting new ways that people are thinking about SUDEP prevention. There's also some studies that are reporting on SUDEP prevention techniques that are specific precision therapies to specific diseases. For example, DEPDEC5, uh, which is the uh, you know, most common genetic disorder causing focal seizures, um, is known to be uh, re um, related to impairment in the mTOR pathway. And so there's at least one paper that has investigated uh, the role of mTOR in inhibition in people with DEPDEC5 or animals, pardon me, with DEC5 as a um, SUDEP prevention technique. Likewise, um, as we have um, heard about, uh, the fact that some SUDEP, although it doesn't appear to be the majority, that some SUDEP, certainly in people with known channelopathies, may be related to cardiac arrhythmias due to the, the co-occurrence of those channel disorders in 
brain and heart. Some of those uh, people may benefit from cardiac in interventions like a pacemaker um, as a CDAP prevention tool. An interesting, uh, another take on the pacemaker style intervention is diaphragmatic pacemakers. Diaphragmatic pacemakers are used for certain uh, diaphragm related and sleep related disorders in humans. And uh, recently diaphragmatic pacing was demonstrated in an animal model to be a suit up rescue technique. So another potential thing that could come down the pipe. La um, I do want to think about whether we can actually develop an intervention that can reduce SUDEP risk. The Mortimus data was already reviewed with you. In this study, Dr. Rivlin and his group presented 11 cases of SUDEP that were monitored in epilepsy monitoring units. And in nine of those cases where people died of SUDEP, CPR was initiated after more than 13 minutes. But in nine near SUDEP cases, uh, where what near SUDEP means that they had a SUDEP but were successfully resuscitated, so there was an arrest, but they were successfully resuscitated, CPR was initiated within three minutes. So what we take from that is that intervening in a person with a cardiac arrest uh, in a SUDEP situation can, in some cases, reverse SUDEP and save a life. So that supports the idea that intervening in the postictal period may reduce SUDEP risk or prevent SUDEP. However, we are challenged by developing uh, any kind of clinical trial to, uh, to actually answer the question of any kind of intervention. Would an intervention prevent SUDAP. We're very challenged by that because of the rarity of SUDAP. A few different people have run the numbers on this. I took this number from Dr. Rivlan's paper. I know Dale Hesdorfer also did some work running the numbers on this to tell us what would be the sample size? How many people would we need to follow for how long to answer a question about an intervention? And here in Dr. Rivlan's numbers, uh, he estimated that we would need to follow about 12,000 people with epilepsy to evaluate uh, the efficacy of a six-month intervention. Obviously, that is not a challenge that I think we can address. And so we really need to think of unique ways to answer the question of whether an inter intervention can reduce risk. Some of the ways to do that are to change our endpoint and use a SUDEP biomarker or a surrogate endpoint as our outcome measure rather than actually SUDEP, or to enroll rather than all types of people living with epilepsy. Um, to enroll subjects who are really just at a very high risk. Lastly, I'd like to talk about this idea of seizure detection. And thanks uh, to uh, my friend and colleague, Dan Friedman, um, for this image. There's a lot of interest in the role of seizure detection devices these days. And I think we already actually even had a couple questions in the chat about this. Uh, we know that there's lots of seizure detection devices uh, coming to market. Some are CE marked or FDA approved, some are not. There are wearable sensors like watches, armbands. There are under the bed mattress sensors that pick up uh, motion. There's video-based detection. I know I'm a pediatric epileptologist. A lot of my patients send me videos. They have video monitors uh, that are motion detectors uh, that are set up in their kids' rooms and they, they send me those videos to review. And then of course there's audio-based seizure detection. The idea here being that the seizure, for this to work as, you know, it's one thing to detect it, it's another thing to detect it and then have um, somebody alerted so that we can intervene. So the idea here is that sensors pick up some signal. And I will say the best detectors are ones that are multimodal using a combination of sensors, including accelerometry, heart rate sensors, oxygen um, sensor, oxygen saturation sensors, um, skin um, conductance centers, sensors. So the best 
detectors from my review are ones that are multimodal using multiple sensors. But the idea here is that the sensors pick something up and then they alert someone and then something, so hopefully an intervention can be delivered. Um, again, a table that um, I developed with Dan Friedman, uh, demonstrating some of the different types of devices that we have and how they could be used. So if you have a wearable device, uh, these have only so far been validated for convulsive seizures, not for non-convulsive seizures. They can be used in and out of the home, which is a benefit, and they are generally associated with remote alerting. But we have to remember that there can be a lot of false alarms, especially when people are awake. And actually in anecdotal evidence, this um, results in people not using their devices when they're not sleeping, which can give a false sense of security. If you're not wearing the device, it's not gonna alert someone when you have a seizure. Video devices also only pick up convulsive seizures and are generally limited to when person is in a bed or certainly when they're in front of the video camera. Similarly, mattress centers only for the bed, limited by a person's body weight. Audio devices, depending on what sounds people make when they have a seizure, may pick up convulsive seizures, may pick up non-convulsive seizures if they're making sound. Audio sensors don't typically have an alarm, but rather just depend on the person listening to the audio, um, the audio device like a baby monitor all the time. If you stop listening or if the sound doesn't wake you up, you won't know that the person is having a seizure. And this would be sim similar for something like a vital sign monitor. Again, lots of discussion around whether seizure detection devices can reduce SUDEP risk or prevent SUDEP. We know that these devices, particularly the multimodal wearable sensors can detect 80 to 100% of tonic-clonic seizures, but they do have a significant false alarm rate, up to one uh, false alarm per day when they're tested in a hospital setting. Don't forget in the hospital, people are mainly, mainly lying around if they're lying in an epilepsy monitoring unit waiting for a seizure. Consider people out and about in the real world, we would expect a higher numbers of false alarms. And we also know that if a person has infrequent seizures, let's say once a month, once every six months, that the likelihood of false alarms um, uh, is higher and that the likelihood that an alarm is an actual seizure becomes quite low. So this could result in things like alarm fatigue. Sometimes we worry about a false sense of security. People think the alarm is on so I don't have to worry about monitoring for seizures in the typical way we would. Um, we are concerned when there are seizures when people are not using their device. And Concern about sleep disturbance due to alarms going off all the time, knowing that sleep deprivation is actually a risk factor for increased seizures. So this is not worked out. There are no studies and based on the numbers needed to treat to prove uh, that an intervention would uh, prevent SUDEP, we're probably not gonna get studies that can demonstrate that any of these devices can actually prevent SUDEP. But if we work in the model of believing that attending to a person after a seizure can reduce SUDEP risk and reducing the frequency of generalized tonic-clonic seizures can reduce risk, certainly using seizure detection devices to optimize both care after or during a seizure and optimize medical care because we can share information about seizure detection devices and seizure alarms with treating teams the healthcare providers, then probably they do have a role in optimizing care and thereby reducing risk and hopefully preventing SUDEP. And then in the future, are we gonna have devices that can actually predict a seizure? If a patient or a person with epilepsy knows in the next six hours, I'm likely to have a seizure, then perhaps they can in, um, implement an intervention like using a rescue med or change their environment to reduce the risk of SUDEP and hopefully prevent a death. So can we prevent SUDEP? Well, we can modify risk and we believe that is a SUDEP prevention tool. That focus on risk reduction, I think um, 
is kind of coming in and out of our whole session today and is very important. There are exciting studies exploring interventions that will improve postictal safety. And I think we're very close to bringing these things forward. And finally, just to reiterate that seizure detection devices are not proven to reduce sit up risk, but may be of value when combined with other interventions. I will leave it at that and ask if there are any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Donor. Uh, it was a very interesting talk, and uh, you addressed that the Holy Grail, the prevention of uh, SUDAP. It's a very, very complicated topic, so I'll say. So uh, I think there are some questions here. Uh, one is uh, this, uh, you are told that uh, treating seizures is uh, one of the best way of prevention and uh, control of uh, SUDAP. So is there a question here, if the patient has got uh, seizures and a neurobehavioral disorder, uh, if you treat the, if you are not treating the neurobehavioral disorder or you treat that, is there a difference in preventing SUDAP? So um, by neurobehavioral disorder, perhaps- right, Psychiatric, we psychiatric like disorder. Autism psychiatric or disorder. psychiatry. So, um, so, you know, I, I think like not to oversimplify it, but like keep, your, keep it on, keep the focus on the bottom line. So if the, if the, what we know, what we have data for is that we want to try and reduce the uh, frequency of generalized convulsive seizures. What, how is that either psychiatric or developmental disorder interfering with our uh, reduction in seizure treatment? Uh, is there an adherence issue? Are there side effect issues that make treating the seizures difficult? I think that's why we need to address the comorbidities as a pseudo prevention tool. Of course, it's a challenge across the world uh, to address the comorbidities associated with epilepsy. I think that uh, that's something um, I certainly see in my practice that we need to improve. Um, and I'm sure that um, others would agree with me about that. Yeah, a specific pediatric question, I think. Uh, uh, is there any high risk for SUDAP in atypical uh, BECTS or the CELEX? The atypical. Yeah, I answered that a little bit in the chat, but I'm happy to address that actually in our data from the North American SUDAP registry. Um, uh, we did report three uh, children with uh, benign epilepsy of childhood with central temporal spikes, which had its name changed now to CELEX. Um, and I think that if you think about that condition, um, and I'm not sure exactly what's meant by atypical BECTS, but if you think about that condition, it does have, you know, previously people have really considered it benign. We're not even supposed to call it benign anymore. And I think that's important that we stop calling it benign because I don't think it's benign. I think people didn't tend to treat it originally. My preference is to treat that condition as a pediatric epileptologist because we're talking about nocturnal seizures, convulsive seizures, and we know those put people at risk. If you consider the atypical category, I'm thinking that's people who maybe have more frequent seizures or um, for whom maybe a first-line treatment doesn't work, then I would think that they're at risk because nocturnal convulsions puts you at risk. Okay, so maybe we can take more questions at the end. Uh, over to Certainly. Monty. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, over to Dr. Leah Blank. Uh, you know, we've learned a lot now and we still need to know the biggest challenge is how to communicate to a caregiver and a patient about SUDEP and why should we be doing it? And, you know, when should we be doing it in, uh, you know, the course uh, as we see our patients uh, uh, coming to us? So Dr. Leah Blank is going to uh, address this um, uh, as, uh, you know, this is an important topic. She's an assistant professor of neurology um, and population health science and policy in Mount Sinai, New York City. Uh, she is an adult epileptologist and uh, a health services researcher who's particularly interested in how to design health systems and improve outcomes uh, through, you know, quality of life improvement, uh, particularly in uh, epilepsy care. She's currently a member of the ILA SUDEP task force. Uh, welcome, Dr. Leah. Thank you for that kind introduction. Let me share my slides. Okay. All right, hopefully you guys can all see this. So um, thank you again for inviting me to speak today. And we're gonna be sort of changing gears a little bit 
um, as was alluded to, and we're going to talk sort of more practically about how do we do this? How do we counsel patients and caregivers? This is called Counseling Patients and Caregivers about SUDEP, why, when, and how. So my only disclosure is that I'm a member of the ILE CDEP task force, which means I'm very invested in people learning about SUDEP and in counseling their patients about SUDEP. So um, I'm gonna stick to this sort of why, when, how format. So talk first a little bit about why SUDEP counseling is important. Um, then talk about when we should counsel people with epilepsy and their caregivers about SUDEP and SUDEP risk and then get a little bit into the details about how we should do that. So how we should counsel them, who should counsel, in what setting, and what should we discuss. So as we're going through this um, and reviewing the recommendations and the literature, we're gonna sort of add to these SUDEP counseling tips for success so that we sort of at the end will have um, tips to help you all counsel your patients. So starting with the why, and I'm hoping that at this point in the um, webinar, you guys are pretty convinced uh, of why we should be doing this counseling. Um, but to summarize, SUDEP is important and it is potentially avoidable. So as compared to um, all other neurologic conditions, SUDEP is second only to stroke in um, leading cause of total years of potential life loss. Um, it's responsible for the deaths of about 1.2 people per thousand person years. And really importantly, we know that seizure freedom is strongly associated with decreased risk of SUDEP. And so this leads us to believe that risk can be reduced by improving our management, our patient's adherence to treatment, and possibly also by these strategies that were discussed like nocturnal monitoring. But most importantly of all, we should be discussing SUDEP with our patients because patients really want to hear about it. So there have been a number of studies over the past decades um, that have talked to and surveyed patients, um, parents and family members of patients, other caregivers, um, families of bereaved, you know, bereaved families who lost um, family members to SUDEP, and overwhelmingly, the majority of these studies report that our patients and their families and caregivers want to hear about SUDEP. Really interestingly, in studies that have looked at, well, maybe not everybody wants to hear about SUDEP, so can we tell just like based on the person that we have in front of us, whether there's someone who would want to hear about SUDEP or not? And the answer is no. So if you in the study that looked at whether age, gender, how long you had had epilepsy, what level of education you had, what kind of job you had, none of that was associated with one, how much you already knew about SUDEP, or two, whether you wanted to know more about SUDEP. So overwhelmingly, our patients want to hear about this. So if they want to hear about it, how are we doing? <laughs> Um, and you can see here just a number of sort of studies selected over time from um, that discussed or that looked at how many people were being counseled about SUDEP. And so the some earlier ones were done. This one's from 2006. That was shortly after um, the United Kingdom had come out with some guidelines about um, SUDEP counseling. And so this was sort of like a first look, like how are we doing at telling our patients about this. And so in that study, about 5% of the neurologists that were surveyed said that they talked about SUDEP with all of their patients. And then you can see about five years later, the number of groups sort of went and looked again and said, oh, well, 5% is not so great if we think that patients want to hear this. Have we gotten better? And, you know, there's um, a handful of studies here, but you can see one of them about 9% of epileptologists were now saying that they discussed SUDEP with all of their patients. And um, the pediatric neurologists look really good here. About 20% um, said that they discussed it with all of their epilepsy patients. And then you can see that last one is uh, actually a chart review. So they looked at an epilepsy clinic and they looked at their notes and they chose patients that definitely met the criteria for epilepsy. And then they said in their notes, is, has there ever been documentation of a discussion of SUDEP? And actually only 4% were 
of those showed that had documented discussions of SUDEP. And you might say, well, you know, maybe people discussed it and didn't document it, but it almost certainly does not account for 96% um, of the people. And then the question is, are, are we doing any better even closer to now? And here's just um, a study um, from a survey done in 2021. And this was a global survey of epileptologists and still only 4% were saying that they discussed SUDEP with all of their patients. So why aren't we doing this? Um, and some of the prior speakers have alluded to this. So um, there's a little bit still of this paternalistic sentiment um, of feeling like we, you know, we'll say we want to protect our patients from emotional distress. This information might be upsetting to them. I know that they have a right to know this, um, but some papers highlight like also this idea of maybe having a right not to know because once they know, they might, you know, be worried or scared um, more so than um, just knowing that they had epilepsy. Um, and a lot of these studies, providers said that they were less likely to discuss SUDEP if they felt that the patient was low risk. So if the patient was, let's say, never having convulsions, they were like, why even bother telling them? Um, if they were, again, were worried about their patient's mood over the long term, if they didn't believe that there was prevention measures, um, and also just fearing like a negative interaction in the clinic visit, like if they thought the person might get really upset in front of them. And I think, again, hopefully, um, the prior speakers have all convinced you that these are not good reasons not to counsel, right? Even if your risk is low, it's not zero. Um, we know from these studies that Dr. Donner highlighted that even if people feel like initially um, when they're interviewed, they say, oh, at first I was feeling, you know, sort of upset and worried, but then, you know, few days and a few weeks later, I felt a lot better and I'm happy I have this information because it lets me make changes to how I take my medications or how I avoid um, my seizure triggers. Um, again, I hope Dr. John will convince you that there is opportunities for prevention in SUDEP. Um, and, you know, as clinicians, we have negative reactions all the time and we're, we're trained to manage these. So I thought this was a really nice summary from a recent um, review on SUDEP counseling um, by Whitney and colleagues um, for reasons to counsel. So as I was alluding to, these patients have a right to know, like every person should be informed about what their diagnosis means, what the risks are. Um, without that knowledge, they can't really make fully informed decisions for their behavior and their you know, adherence to treatment et cetera. Um, it's also really important for maintaining the therapeutic relationship. I think a lot of the fears that physicians voice in bringing this up is about like maintaining a therapeutic relationship, not wanting to upset patients. Um, but obviously if you don't tell someone about the risk of SUDEP and then they find it out on the internet or from a friend or a family member or whoever, they're not going to trust you, right? You didn't tell them that they could die. You're supposed to be their physician. Like that is can be very problematic to um, patient-physician relationships. Um, it's also a really great opportunity to avoid misinformation. If you talk openly about it with patients, then if they get other information from other sources, they can come back to you and say, I know you told me this and I heard this and they're not the same, which is true. Can we talk about it? Um, and then again, this idea of epilepsy self-management, you have to know your risks to be able to make appropriate decisions and hopefully be motivated to make good decisions um, for your treatment. Um, again, you know, all playing into the SUDEP risk reduction and finally into educating and empowering patients to really take the best care possible of themselves. Um, to do that, they really need um, a collaborative relationship with their physician and also all the information. So for our tips for success, we should counsel every patient, which brings us to when. So now we know we wanna counsel everyone, when should we counsel them? So this is from the um, 2019 uh, American Epilepsy Society position statement on SUDEP counseling. And so they have this section that says, these are scenarios when you should think about counseling about SUDAP. So you can see they say convulsive seizures, especially if they're frequent, as we've heard multiple times today, 
that means you're at greater risk. So those people should be told. Again, Dravet syndrome associated with increased risk of SUDEP. Those people should also be told. If you have seizures in sleep, you should also talk to them about SUDEP because they're at increased risk. If they're not adherent to treatment, it's another time to counsel them because they could make changes that could decrease potentially their risk of SUDEP. Um, and then also patients who are concerned already about their mortality related to epilepsy, this might be really um, helpful to them because you can tell them that their risk of mortality is most likely extremely low. But most importantly um, is number six, right? A new epilepsy diagnosis. So again, from all of these um, studies surveying patients about what and families and caregivers about what information they would want about SUDEP and when they would want it, overwhelmingly they say, again, that they would like to be informed of their SUDEP risk at or around the time of diagnosis. So again, this really means that everybody should be getting this information. So every patient, and it should be at or around the time of diagnosis. You're gonna probably have multiple discussions, right, about mortality over time, um, but they should start when you deliver the epilepsy diagnosis. So again, back to our tips for success, every patient at or near diagnosis is when should, we should be counseling. So now we know why and when, um, and we're moving to the, how do we do this? So we know we wanna counsel them. We wanna counsel them very early on, like either when we deliver or shortly after we deliver the diagnosis of epilepsy. So how do we do this? So this is sort of a extra question, who? Um, so us, <laughs> so the neurologist or epilepsy specialist is um, cited by both neurologists and patients and caregivers as being the person that they want to deliver this information. So patients who let's say have a convulsion like as their first seizure and they end up in the emergency room, they don't want the emergency room doctor to have a long discussion with them about mortality. They would like to follow up with the physician who's gonna be treating them over time and who has a relationship with them. And they would like to have that conversation with that person. Um, and then for children, again, the parents, caregivers want this information. And then about half of them would like to discuss it themselves with their child. About a third say that they want the healthcare provider to discuss it directly with the child. And then about 20% are sort of undecided as to who or even if they want their children to know this information. All right, so <laughs> just for success, we're gonna counsel every patient at or near diagnosis by the treating neurologist. And how exactly we are going to do this. So here is more information um, put out by um, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the United Kingdom, and they have some guidelines about how information should be delivered around SUDEP. So they say that they should have access to multiple sources information. It should be included in literature on epilepsy in particular to show how preventing seizures might be important um, and that it should be really tailored. So there should be tailored information and tailored discussion um, about that person's risk of SUDEP um, and that this information should be given to the person and or the caregivers as appropriate. So how do we do this? Face-to-face. -face. So if patients want to hear it from us, they're like long-term provider, and they want to hear it in person. They don't want us to just like hand them a pamphlet as they walk out the door. They don't want some like voice recording or an email or something popping up in their electronic medical record. They really want to have a face-to-face -face conversation about this um, because it's obviously very important to them. So we're gonna counsel every patient at or near diagnosis by us um, and face-to-face. -face. And then once you're in the room face-to-face -face with them, you really have to think about this tailored to the individual. So you wanna talk about what SUDEP is. And these are some like, language and information that is um, suggested by the AES practice guideline. Um, so you wanna say you know, what SUDEP is, that it's sudden, that it's non-traumatic, non-accidental death, it's not explained by another cause, it more often occurs at night, it may or may not be in the context of a seizure, and that we don't fully understand that like the mechanisms are thought to be multifactorial and there's a lot of research going on 
around this. Um, and then you want to dive into the risk, right? So you want to tell them a little bit about risk in general so that SUDEP is uncommon and maybe one in a thousand people will be affected per year. Um, and then you want to talk about their specific risk. So we know that these things increase risk, like having ongoing seizures, which you have, so that puts you at highest risk, or you don't have, so you're really low risk and you shouldn't worry about this much. And then, of course, if you're telling them about the risk, the very next thing you want to talk about is prevention, right? So we know that seizure freedom decreases the risk of SUDEP. So if you are at higher risk or lower risk, really either way, you should know that we really want to avoid seizures and the seizures we most want to avoid are convulsions. Um, and this is the reason that we want you to really make sure that you're taking your anti-seizure medication and that you're avoiding your seizure triggers. And then that we have to tell them that we have a role to play, right? So our job is to make sure that we're really aggressive in treating your seizures and that if you have ongoing seizures that will make changes to your medications that will refer you for epilepsy surgery if that's appropriate. Um, then depending on their risk category and, you know, the sort of family and social environment, you might want to talk about some other sort of supervision or other sort of um, devices if it's appropriate. Um, and then really make sure that your counseling is matching um, the patient risk with the potential benefit. And then um, last but definitely not least, that this is ongoing and that um, there's new research all the time coming out about SUDEP. And so that recommendations might change and that, you know, I will come back to you when things change and I might say, now you should do this or now you should do that or your risk has changed and this is why and this is what we're going to do about it. All right, so we are going to counsel every patient at or near diagnosis by the treating neurologist. It's going to be face-to-face. -face. We will discuss what SUDEP is, tailored risk for the patient and prevention strategies. And then that's not all, right? So after you've discussed it, um, a lot of people are getting a lot of information in these visits, especially since we're supposed to be counseling near um, the time of diagnosis. So, you know, you want to give people written information, ideally that's somewhat tailored to them, that can sort of jog their memory. And so when they're you know, back at home and talking to their family and friends about what they've learned about their condition, they have something to refer to. And then really make it clear that this is just the first of many conversations that um, they can follow up with their provider that they just had a conversation with or with another nurse or social worker. And that like these conversations will continue to happen over time and their questions and concerns can be addressed at any time. All right, so one last time, um, suit up counseling tips for success. So counsel every patient at or near diagnosis by the treating neurologist, face-to-face, -face, discuss what SUDEP is, tailored risk to the patient, prevention strategies. Afterwards, give them a handout so they have something to go home with um, and continue the conversation at next visits. Um, and these are the three, if you only remember three things, um, from what I said here today, um, it's please remember that SUDEP is rare, but potentially preventable in some patients, that patients and caregivers want to be told about SUDEP risk and how to reduce it, and that all patients should be counseled at or near diagnosis. All right, and this is just a big thank you to, um, these are the people on the SUDEP task force for helping put this together and for everyone else that was involved in um, making this happen. And of course, for all the people who have contributed to the literature around SUDEP and SUDEP counseling. I guess we'll take the questions, uh, Suvasani. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Leah, for that uh, excellent talk. And uh, I couldn't find any questions on uh, specifically on counseling in the chat. So um, most of the questions have actually been answered by the experts previous, for the previous talk. So please look at the answers. Uh, but I would like to ask you, Leah, what would your suggestion be for, um, I mean, low resource settings where people are seeing a lot of patients in a limited time? How can they fit this in into their practice? That is going to be a big challenge in India. Yeah, so, I mean, I think, you know, the, the idea is that this is information that you're give over, over time, right? So you don't have to give every single piece of information in your first visit. And I think that most people actually can't even take that much information, right? Like it's a lot and it's too much. 
Um, so I think that like you really want to introduce it and that can be very brief, right? Like for many of my patients, it's probably less than a minute that I spend on SUDEP, right? And I say, this is what it is. I think your risk is X or Y. This is what you can do to reduce your risk more. And we can keep talking about it. Um, and so it doesn't, I don't think it actually takes so much time, um, but patients really appreciate it. And then if people are really worried, they can come back to you. Okay, I think that is uh, an eye opener less than a minute. So I guess people can incorporate it into their practice, but even worldwide, there, is, there seems to be reluctance even after 50, 15 years later, it's still showing 4%. So this reluctance is not just time, I guess. It's an overall reluctance to mention death. I think people are really afraid to say it, but at least, and obviously the other clinicians on this panel should feel free to speak up about their experiences, but I feel that most people, you know, within this big, like life altering diagnosis of epilepsy, it's like small, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's all big. And so it's just like another thing. And then if they're worried about it, you know, some people come back and want to talk more, but a lot of them are, you know, are low risk and they, agree with the assessment that they're low risk and they, you know, don't. So there is, okay. I think Dr. Dr. Torban wants to add, please, please stop. Yeah, I think this was an excellent presentation of, of uh, uh, counseling. The point I want to make is that um, I think SUDEP information should be part of a general uh, discussion about seizure related risks. Uh, and not only just SUDA. Um, it, it should be part of that, but it must be part of that. I mean, I totally agree. And that's how I do it, right? I say like, you have epilepsy, here are all these things. One of them is this, I think your risk is high, low, medium, and these are the things that you can do to prevent it. And then um, I give them- One question is that too. Yeah, so one question is that some private practitioners are scared that if they talk about SUDEP, then the patients will not come back to them. It's, they don't want to hear bad news. So, so is there any way to, like you said, you I guess you, you explain the risk in the context? Yeah, I mean, again, I I would love to hear from other um, clinicians, but that has not been my experience. I tell every patient at their first <laughs> visit, like when I give them an epilepsy diagnosis, um, and even the people, you know, who seem more upset, like you, once you contextualize their risk, again, as Dr. Thompson was saying, like along other risks with seizures, um, I think they get it and they, they're, you know, they're appreciative because people do, again, all of these studies support this. People want to know what the risk is, right? Like they know epilepsy is not you don't want to have epilepsy, right? So they know there's dangerous things about it. And this is one of the dangers. And I think they appreciate people being straightforward about what the dangers might be and what the risk is. And for most people, it's it's low, right? These are small numbers. They're real numbers and they should know about them, but they're small. Yeah, I think I last Dr. Manjiri, she has experience in the Indian context about talking about Sudev. Uh, she can tell the audience about yeah. it. Uh, so that was precisely the question we had in our mind um, before we set out on, uh, you know, interviewing uh, patients and giving them information about uh, SUDEP. Uh, generally, in the Indian cultural context, uh, it's not, uh, you know, hard to be talking about death and uh, th that subject is a taboo. Um, but uh, so we had this randomized study where... Uh, we uh, did, uh, you know, give information uh, about uh, SUDEP and uh, we tracked uh, whether it affected their adherence and we also tracked whether it affected their uh, quality of life and uh, whether it worsened their anxiety scores to learn about the fact that there is a possibility of, uh, you know, one of the risks being uh, death. And the subject uh, was discussed in a matter of fact way. Uh, the way we asked them is that, uh, what did you think uh, when your child or when your uh, loved one had a seizure? And invariably, I think 80, 85% of them would say that, I, I almost thought that the child died. So, you know, when we discuss it with them and it comes from their side, 
So they are so frightened of seeing the seizure happen before them that they would, they would, you know, most of them would say that they almost thought that the child died or would be dying. And that's where we used to take off and say, uh, no, generally the seizures stop in two minutes. Rarely they can continue for five minutes. And uh, sometimes there can be a fracture. Sometimes there can be a dislocation. And rarely they can be a death. So it was easier done that way in a conversational style rather than just, you know, telling them that your child can die. And uh, none of them had a worsening of quality of life or worsening of anxiety scores. In fact, they had an improvement in adherence. So uh, I think um, uh, from what study we did, we were pretty much convinced that information has to be given, um, preferably in a conversational style so that uh, it does impact uh, their adherence to medicines, which often our patients are not. So much. Uh, there's a couple of more questions, uh, not related to counseling, but one uh, the question is that uh, parents ask that should we install CCTV cameras? Uh, I'll ask Dr. Donna this question. Would uh, would if the patients ask parents ask you this question? Uh, um, so I, I saw that question. It's uh, regarding cameras and whether <clears throat> people should be installing cameras. I, I think with all the devices any seizure uh, detection device, we need to think about uh, targeting it to the seizure type and targeting it to the family um, situation. So um, does this child have the type of seizure that will be picked up by a video camera? Do they like physically convulse? And it's not just a video camera. You really need to, I think, invest in one of these cameras that will alarm for when they see, when they pick up a motion sensor, right? Because just videoing all night, I mean, that might provide you data in the morning, but it's not gonna give you any kind of alarm of what happens through the night. So you'll, the parent would just sleep through it. So are you, know, are you talking about a device that's actually gonna provide an alarm? And is it gonna alarm for things that are useful to you? And then um, lastly, is there anybody who's gonna be able to respond to the alarm? So I've said this before, Sebastian, you might've heard me say it. Like, I think we feel pretty, you and I, we're pretty lucky working in pediatrics, right? Because all our patients sleep with their parents, if not in the same room, at least in the same house. And so uh, there's never a question of, oh, there won't be anybody around to answer an alarm. But when I talk to my colleagues who treat adults, what good is wearing a seizure watch or using a video camera if there's no one nearby to intervene in the time of the seizure. So you really have to tailor it to each family. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think there's one more question that uh, it's question is why are adults more prone to SUDEP than children? But I think first the question, are they more prone? Like, I think I would like you to take well, that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Tormuren could comment on this as well. Like both of our groups. So the older data suggested that there was a, reduced risk in children compared to adults, about a, almost a tenfold less uh, risk. But then um, more recent uh, data that came both out of Tormund's group and out of my group demonstrated that actually the risk in children appears to be the same as it is in children, in adults. One per, and that's why you can kind of go with the one per 1,000 per year uh, across the board. But they, you know, people have queried whether duration of epilepsy is a risk factor. Some studies suggested that it was, but it, in the meta-analysis that we did for the AAN guideline, it didn't come out as a strong uh, risk factor duration of epilepsy. Do you, do you want me to make a comment on, on, on what you said about uh, the differences, if there are, in, in the incidence between children and adults? Um, yeah, you and I, uh, Elizabeth, we had, we had the same results, basically the same uh, incidence rate. Um, in children as in adults, um, if there is a difference, uh, and uh, it is for a, a slightly lower incidence in children, which I think is, is not a surprise, given that children live in families. Children do not live alone. Uh, they have someone to supervise uh, if, if a seizure occurs. So it's probably not because seizures are, are less harmful in children than they are in, in adults. It, it's, if there is a difference, I think it's more related to the level of supervision in a family versus in an uh, adult person living alone. And you know, um, 
we know SUDEP's multifactorial. A lot of the things we talked about today are kind of high level in general um, and supported by big numbers. But um, in the case of children uh, and SUDEP, I have lots of examples of uh, parents being present in bed with their children when they've died. And so um, in some cases, like for example, in Dravé syndrome, there might, there might be other mechanisms at work or other things going on that are um, kind of facilitating these deaths, even, the, even in the presence of a caregiver. Okay. I think that's very helpful and we are nearing the end. So uh, I think it was an amazing session. I would, uh, Dr. Manji, do you want to add one last word? <laughs> Well, as far as SUDEP goes, I think uh, the more we discuss, uh, the more awareness is generated. Uh, and here, this is one topic where we just don't have to generate awareness for uh, the people with epilepsy and the caregivers, but for physicians and uh, epileptologists uh, treating epilepsy, because as uh, discussed, uh, not many of them are actually uh, talking about it uh, to their patients. So we have to do a bi-directional kind of uh, discussion on this. And, uh, you know, uh, we did one with caregivers last time, Suhasani, and uh, I think uh, doing this one meets both those, uh, you know, objectives of, uh, you know, involving uh, the caregiver as well as uh, the people who have to be delivering the information. So I think it was wonderful uh, and I learned a lot. Uh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you to all the excellent speakers, uh, Dr. Rayner and Dr. Rayner for chairing this session. It was, it's been amazing. We had an amazing uh, attendance. So thanks to all the participants for listening and your questions. And I thank everyone once again for participating. Thank you.